Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you tonight. Give me just a second. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, welcome to America at a Crossroads, our 104th consecutive week of programming. Welcome from Jews United for Democracy and Justice and from Community Advocates uh, Inc. and from our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Zevi Oslovsky, Rabbi Ken Chasen, Caroline Kelly, David Lair, and myself. Tonight we present Brett Stevens for the second in our series, An Expert's View of a Topsy-Turvy World, in conversation with the always wonderful Matt, Pat Morrison. Brett, last week's column in the form of a letter to the Supreme Court justices about the leaked draft opinion, which ostensibly will overturn a woman's right to abortion, the column was exceptionally moving. Uh, we included it in last week's emails to our audience, and I hope that everyone in tonight's audience has read it or will read it. If you need it, I'll be happy to send you another link. It's in all of last week's emails. Thank you for that, Brett, and thank you to both of you for being with us tonight. Next week, we had planned to present Ambassador Dennis Ross on Tuesday night, but due to Dennis's complicated travel schedule and work, he has informed us of the need to reschedule that program. So stand by for an alternative date. But in the meantime, we are thrilled to announce that at our regular time, which is 5 p.m. on Wednesday, California time, we will present Max Boot, who will talk on the topic, Is American Democracy at the Tipping Point? Be sure to sign up via the email you will get at the end of tonight's program. In two weeks, we will resume with the third part of our topsy-turvy series uh, with, uh, with Leon Panetta, a most extraordinary American who has been a congressman, a presidential chief of staff, secretary of the defense, head of the CIA, and more. His 360 degree perspective from his vast experience in government will be sure to shed new light on many important topics. Thank you again for being here. And now here's David, my partner, to tell you about more of our upcoming programs and introduce tonight's moderator. Thank David. You, Janice. Following up on the guest as Janet has, Janice has mentioned, we will soon host the Washington Post's most prolific columnist who miraculously produces at least one or two quality op-eds each day, Jennifer Rubin. She'll be interviewed by KCRW's Mad Madeline Brand. In coming weeks, we will host the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning, winning senior writer whom we just secured today, David Leonhardt. He authors the paper's flagship daily newsletter, The Morning. It's an often incisive analysis of important, currently debated topics, usually replete with data. This week, we also secured Bill Browder, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Freezing Order, a true story of money laundering, murder, and surviving Vladimir Putin's wrath. Browder was, at one point, the largest foreign investor in post-Soviet Union Russia. His inside account of being literally a top target of Putin, along with the Kremlin's murder of his lawyer and mafia-like extortion of his company, is especially timely as we try to understand what animates Russia's leader. It's now my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend, a Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist for the Los Angeles Times, and the winner of numerous Emmys and Golden Mics for her work on public television and radio, the astute and analytical Pat Morrison. Pat? Thank you, David and Janice, and thank you to everyone who's joining us this evening. Top of the list, Brett Stevens is the Pulitzer Prize-winning American conservative journalist, editor, and columnist known for his neoconservative foreign policy opinions and for being part of the right of center opposition to Donald Trump. Uh, he began working as an opinion columnist at the New York Times in April of 2017, and a couple of months later started as a contributor to NBC News. Before that, he worked for the Wall Street Journal as a foreign affairs columnist, later as deputy editorial page editor, and from 2002 to 2004, was editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. He won his Pulitzer for commentary in 2014. The year after that, he wrote America in Retreat, the New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder. We'll find out more about that. And perhaps he has another book in the works because there's yet more disorder. There's always something more of that to write about. Brett, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be with you. There are any number of stories that crowd the number one story slot this week, but I suppose the story that grabbed everyone by the lapels was the leak of the draft Supreme Court opinion about Roe versus Wade. And for me, although the substance was not a surprise for most people, the shock of the release and just the, the nature of it seemed to rank up there with the smoking gun of the Watergate tapes so or listening to Donald Trump trying to catch votes from the Georgia Secretary of State. Uh, this 
re recalculates the political field in a way that uh, maybe hasn't been done in a long time and maybe animates a part of the voting population that hasn't been heard from in a long time, say the nearly 50 years since Roe. How do you analyze the impact of this dropping in the middle of what was already a difficult political year for both sides? Well, uh, great question. I was on a panel just yesterday with um, number of people, including the wonderful Linda Greenhouse, longtime Supreme Court uh, um, reporter for, uh, for, the, uh, for the New York Times. She described it as a crisis for uh, democracy. Um, and I suppose that in some ways uh, she is right. It is certainly going to lead to a set of really profoundly vexing constitutional questions and the possibility of what might be called a certain kind of constitutional segregation of a kind that we haven't seen in this country for over 50 years, in which rights that were previously fundamental across the land will become, will be honored in some states, uh, but taken away in, um, uh, in others and taken away uh, primarily to those who um, are least able to afford um, the, the uh, ability to um, go elsewhere for, uh, for reproductive services for an abortion if they, if they need one. So in that sense, I think she's, uh, Linda was, was, was right on the money. On the other hand, and I, I say this as someone who thinks that the Supreme Court, if it votes to overturn Roe, is making a big mistake in terms of its own legitimacy, in terms of overturning 50 years of its own precedents. Um, I wouldn't call it a crisis for democracy, Pat. I would say that prospectively, it's an opportunity for democracy. Because the one thing that is possible, even now, is to take this question of abortion and return it uh, to the people um, and, and energize uh, parts of the electorate that had, I think, formerly become almost indifferent to the question of reproductive uh, rights uh, and freedoms at multiple levels of government to realize that this is something that genuinely uh, matters and particularly matters at the state level. And I say this again, as someone who's typically on the conservative side of uh, many political questions, but certainly not when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to abortion rights. Uh, the last decade or so has been very bad for uh, pro-choice uh, advocates in government state houses and governorships, but also in, in, in the legislatures. I think there's been a certain amount of, of indifference there. And I hope, when in keeping with this theme of an opportunity for democracy, that voters become energized and realize that very serious things are at stake, things they really hadn't had to think about for half a century. Uh, very serious things at stake. On the 20th anniversary of Roe, I interviewed and wrote my column about a doctor who in the days before Roe had worked in what were called the septic abortion wards, where young women who tried to induce abortion were brought when either that failed or succeeded. And, and invariably, he said, a great many of them died. This is going to be in our faces again. And so it, it's an opportunity in a sense of re-energizing a part of the electorate that had taken this for granted. And it may be Democrats and it may be some pro-choice Republicans, but the Republican electorate seems to be doubling down on this. You had Mitch McConnell talk about a nationwide abortion ban. And just today, a vote to, to uh, legislate uh, the right to abortion into law failed in the United States Senate. So it's, it's going to be played out politically. Uh, are the Republicans going to mess it up? Or are the Democrats going to mess it up? Well, uh, the Democrats seem to have a bottomless ability to mess up things politically. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think this will play out over the long term. You know, when I wrote my column to those who, who haven't uh, had a chance to read it, it was really directed, um, I mean, it was formally addressed to uh, five of the Supreme Court justices. Really, I had in mind just uh, two people, Neil Gorsuch, who sometimes surprises in terms of his uh, opinions, and Chief Justice Roberts, who also understands that there are large things at stake in certain decisions when it comes to the legitimacy of the court itself. And I wanted to address a conservative case to them. One, one point of it was the question of precedent of stare decisis. Um, as even Brett Kavanaugh put it in his confirmation hearing, Roe is not just the law of the land, uh, it is precedent upon precedent because it was reaffirmed 
in the Casey decision. But as you also put it, um, Pat, it's supposed to be conservatives who try to think carefully about this, this thing called unintended consequences. And one of the unintended consequences of um, uh, overturning Roe in this Dobbs decision um, will not be the end of abortion. It will be the end of safe and legal abortions. And that's a fundamental, uh, fundamental distinction. Just as, just as prohibition was not the end of drinking, it was simply the end of uh, uh, legal drinking, we're gonna have something similar on our hands uh, very soon. That's why I said that a decision to overturn Roe was a radical, not a conservative uh, um, move. It's also radical when two or three people in an unelected Senate, or excuse me, an unelected Supreme Court, remove rights that have been the expectation of generations of um, American women. Some of my conservative friends have said, well, you know, some presidents deserve to, to end because I mean, look at, for instance, the Plessy v. Ferguson precedent, which stood for 58 years and upheld you know, a vile system of segregation in the American South. That fortunately was put to an end by Brown versus Board. But what Plessy did was remove a right that had been previously given to uh, Black Americans. What this decision, uh, what Roe did, was to extend a right, which has now been uh, an expectation of Americans for, for, for a half century. So they're fundamentally different things. Now, I have no idea whether uh, what I said will, will move the justices, but it was my one opportunity to, I hope, move the needle and persuade them on their terms, not just on the terms of the left. And it's curious because we have just finished talking about some of the political consequences in terms of either party, but the court itself has been under assault, its reputation, its standing for a very long time uh, in terms of how it arrives at its decisions. People have pointed out that Amy Coney Barrett, Coney Barrett and uh, Justice Kavanaugh both talked about Roe or questions about Roe during their confirmation hearings. And the fact that the court looks more and more like the same political party pendulum that we're accustomed to seeing, and less and less like the referee calling balls and strikes, which is the phrase that Justice Roberts likes to use. Right, and it, and and there's a question. I, I bet my friend Max Boot will address this when he when 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 he speaks to you. But you know, if America has one truly truly profound problem, uh, I tried to write an optimistic column uh, in the paper today. It is the diminishing, um, almost vanishing trust in bedrock American institutions, the institutions of, uh, of, of the checks and balances of Congress, the presidency, and now the court. And as, as trust in institutions diminishes our ability to maintain uh, a successful um, democracy governed by a consistent rule of law to which people feel bound, is also going to wane. So this is yet another of what I think are going to be dreadful consequences that flow from this decision. Again, I'm trying to be optimistic and think that in two or four or even 10 years time, the 80% of Americans or 81% of Americans who think that abortion should be in one form or another legal will have their democratic say and impose their views on what I think is a radical minority, not the other way around. I want to get more into your topic of pessimism from your column today, but a subject that has appalled the world and at the same time given much of the world something to rally about is the Russian war on Ukraine and how the Ukrainians have responded. Finally, Joe Biden has gotten through his version of the Lend-Lease plan, which is the plan by which the United States helped uh, Great Britain before going to war, before joining into World War II. And, uh, and Americans seem very much unified in, in their support for how the plucky Ukrainians are holding out against Russia. And also, less, perhaps less so, less obviously, how the veil has been rent from the face of Vladimir Putin. Well, I mean, it's, it's really uh, extraordinary on, on many levels. One, one level I was reflecting on today is how democracies always seem, or often, not always, but often seem to find the leadership they need at precisely the moment they, they, they most need it. So that a, uh, 
uh, a rail splitting lawyer out of nowhere in Illinois could save the union in 1860, uh, in 1861, um, how a uh, politician in the British uh, parliamentary wilderness could come out of obscurity and save Great Britain in 1940. Now it, it took a comedian who turned into a statesman to, I hope, uh, save not just Ukraine, but save really the idea that used to be common and it's since somewhat vanished, the idea of a free world, the idea that um, we have something profoundly in common, whether you're in California or, or in Long Island or wherever, something profoundly in common with the people of Ukraine who simply want to have uh, a say, uh, the, uh, have, have, make the, have the decisive say in their future and not simply be treated as a part of uh, one power or another's so-called uh, sphere of influence. I think it's also unmasked Vladimir Putin, not just as the evil, genuinely evil uh, person that he is, I think we've, we've, we've known that, but it's also unmasked him for his miscalculation, for buying into his own regime's lies uh, and uh, mythologies and, and propaganda. And so perhaps in that sense, it's given the West, or I should say the free world, um, a sense of A, what its values are, what its capacity is, um, and a better sense of, of the real strength of, um, of its adversaries, whether it's in uh, Moscow or Beijing or Tehran. We've had a lot of clarifying moments in American politics recently. No one seems to be able to sit on the sidelines nor should anymore. But does the does Zelensky's leadership and the disequilibrium of this war, do all of these things kind of reanimate an American sense of its own democracy? Does our thinking go that deep? I hope so. And I think there are signs of it. I really think there are signs of it when we understand, you know, uh, there's the famous line, and I'm abusing this line in, in, in a number of ways, but I'll use it anyway. Someone said, why are the politics in, at university so vicious because the stakes are so small? I thought that was right? Henry Kissinger, no? Was that Kissinger who said so. that? that might, might have, lots of things are attributed to Henry Kissinger, but um, at any rate, uh, look, the stakes in American politics obviously are not small, but what is happening in Ukraine might put into perspective some of the divisions and the problems that we have here in the United States, um, in the sense that even now, even with the threats we just um, underlined and are, are, are serious, even now we are a self-governing democracy, largely at peace, largely in charge of our own fate, largely secure from, from some of the true tragedies of the world. And looking at Ukraine might remind us that um, these things like civil liberties, human rights, uh, democratic representation, uh, national sovereignty and independence are things that are truly, not just truly valuable, but um, under threat. Um, and that we can't simply be cavalier about uh, what is happening in places we almost had never heard of before, whether it's Donetsk, Luhansk, uh, the Donbass, Snake Island in the Black, uh, in, in, in the Black Sea, uh, because ultimately that's going to have an effect on our, on the perpetuation of our own political institutions, as, as Abraham Lincoln once, uh, once put it. So the stakes are real. The freedoms we have are, are, are genuinely uh, precious and worth fighting for. And maybe what divides us isn't quite uh, so great as what still unites us. And perhaps more than anything else that could have happened short of global warfare, the, the war on Ukraine by Russia has reestablished the United States as a world leader in a way that was under threat and in doubt before and makes us think, what if Donald Trump had been president now? What if he were to be president again in 2024? Well, you know, I've been very critical of the Biden administration, but I've been critical from the point of view of someone who is trying to help a, a, a friend who's stumbling, not a, a foe you wanna see or an adversary you wanna see fall down. And I think that after um, a somewhat belated start, the Biden administration has done uh, remarkably well in terms of um, giving the Ukraine the kind of support that it needs to fight an effective, a devastating, in fact, um, counteroffensive 
uh, against, uh, against the Russian uh, invasion. Perhaps they've talked a little too loosely in terms of revealing some of what some of the help that, that the United States appears to be providing uh, Ukraine, but it's been um, it's been a magnificent performance. Sometimes some of my friends on the right will tell me that uh, oh this would never have happened under uh, Donald Trump's presidency, but it was Donald Trump who advertised at every opportunity that not only was he not interested in helping. Um, our friends and allies to whom we did not have treaty obligations, for instance, the Kurds in, in Syria, uh, he wasn't necessarily interested in coming to the uh, aid of uh, NATO member states like, uh, like uh, the Baltics. Trump's view of the world was a zero-sum view um, in which America couldn't lead, it could only, uh, it could only dominate, um, where every, every foreign policy decision wasn't informed by moral considerations, but was effectively some kind of transactional device. You saw that in the way that Trump mistreated and abused President Zelensky back in 2019 by threatening to withhold military aid in exchange, uh, or unless he got uh, political dirt on, um, on the Biden family. So I'm uh, not so convinced, in fact, I'm not convinced at all, that this invasion wouldn't have happened had Trump remained uh, uh, president. I think uh, Putin saw Trump as, uh, as uh, the man he met at Helsinki back in 2017 or 20, uh, uh, 2018. Um, and I certainly have no confidence that the Trump, administ the Trump administration would have handled this crisis uh, any better than uh, the Biden administration has. So I actually, you know, I, I say this as someone who, again, has been very critical of President Biden in some respects, but I give him good marks for the way he's conducted himself in the last couple of months. One of our guests, Paul, wants to know, other than Putin being removed from power, how do you think the war in Ukraine can end? Well, I think what might happen, I mean, this is, it's hard to forecast, and I hate predictions that you'll, you, you, you might remember. Ask me about something that might happen in 100 years, and then, then I'll be more confident. So I suspect you're not around are, to, to have to pay the bet then? I suspect we are going to move towards something like a, a front in which Russia, instead of being on the offensive, an offensive it clearly doesn't have the capability to carry out because it doesn't have the logistics, I think it's beginning to lose the kind of firepower it needs, is going to try to dig in and create uh, a kind of, um, I don't want to call it a Maginot line, but some kind of defensive line around the areas that it has conquered in eastern and southern Ukraine around the city of Kherson, around now conquered uh, uh, Mariupol. Um, Ukraine, for the time being, is not going to be able to accept um, having uh, essentially not only a limb cut off, but in many respects, its most valuable limb, its access to the sea um, and its access to a lot of its uh, mineral riches, uh, the shale gas, uh, coal, and, 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 and uh, other forms of energy. And so the fight is going to continue. Now, there is a risk, and it's real, that uh, Putin is going to um, follow the Russian doctrine of what's called escalate to de-escalate, which is to do something shocking and dramatic, like using a battlefield tactical nuclear weapon in order to scare Ukraine into some kind of uh, agreement. I think if Putin does that, it will be an even more severe miscalculation uh, on, uh, on his part. Um, my guess is that Ukraine will be able to recapture some of the territory, but Zelensky obviously understands that um, a, a moral and strategic victory that leaves some territory in the hands of the Russians, but uh, has payoffs on the Western side, for instance, membership in the European Union, or as I believe, membership in NATO, would be um, a good way to find a way to end uh, uh, end this war. And certainly Ukrainian membership in NATO would be the most visible kind of strategic and political defeat that uh, Putin could sustain. Let's talk more about domestic politics and, and the Republican Party, which still is dividing itself into Trump supporters and uh, Trump opponents, although fewer and fewer of the latter seem to be elected officials. We had J.D. Vance, who had an outside chance to get the nomination for Senate in Ohio, uh, who, who won, who went to the top on the strength of, presumably, of uh, Trump's endorsement. J.D. Vance, by the way, said he didn't care what happened in Ukraine. 
So let's look at how the, the GOP is dividing up once again, even when you've got leadership, people like Lindsey Graham and Kevin McCarthy, who right after the January 6th uh, coup attempt were excoriating Donald Trump, telling him to lay off and back off, who are now evidently back in his corner again. Yeah, everyone is afraid of Trump. He's the, he's the, he's the schoolyard bully who um, uh, doesn't have the power to persuade, but certainly has the power to terrorize, at least politically, uh, politically speaking. He didn't, Trump didn't, Trump's candidates didn't win uh, everywhere. Uh, a West Virginia Republican uh, that Trump favored uh, won his primary, but uh, in Nebraska, it was the anti-Trump candidate who, who uh, won. Um, paradoxically, um, I think if, if Democrats somehow uh, survive, what was Obama's word, the, the, uh, uh, the expected shellacking in the midterms in November, it's gonna be thanks to Donald Trump because um, he is supporting candidates who are uh, in many, I mean, well in step with the far right of the Republican Party, but very much out of step with uh, with uh, the broader uh, the broader electorate. It reminds me a little bit of 2010 when Republicans like uh, O'Donnell in Delaware, remember she went on TV to say she was not a witch, or Todd Akin in Missouri who said something about uh, legitimate rape, I think I'm quoting him, quote unquote, legitimate rape, uh, managed to uh, uh, deny Republicans um, seats in the Senate because these guys were, were these people were just uh, uh, so extreme. On the other hand, um, Democrats need to be realistic. Uh, this country um, is not in a better place with the exception of the obvious exception that Donald Trump is not in the White House. But economically, socially, uh, in many other respects, the country is not in a better place today than it was uh, um, two years ago or a year, year and a half ago. And that is going even to- with, Even with COVID? You think COVID years were better than the non or waning COVID years? Well, I mean, that's, I don't think COVID really counts for, for a couple of reasons. Trump was dealing with the very beginning of the, of the, the Trump administration was dealing with the very beginning of the pandemic, but more Americans died uh, in 2021, uh, and, and since then, um, I mean, we can go on as to the reasons why vaccine refusal and, and, and so on, uh, but I don't, think, I don't think the president is gonna get that much credit for uh, the handling of, uh, of COVID. I think the principal issues that are gonna weigh very heavily on Democrats are first of all, inflation, Second of all, a sense that they are in some ways responsible for the, the, the crime wave and thirdly, if there are crises at the border, uh, migration crises at the border, uh, that too is going to look, uh, uh, that's not going to help uh, uh, Democrats, particularly, by the way, I should say, the, the seats in play here are not the safe Democratic seats, okay? AOC is going to be reelected in Congress in, 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 uh, in Queens and, and the Bronx. It's the moderate Democrats who are really at risk here. And I don't think the administration has moved nearly swiftly enough to give those moderate Democrats, both in the House and the Senate, people like Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire, the kind of political comfort they need to run uh, successful races. The Republicans will very likely in some districts be on the defensive when it comes to Roe. And this summer, we're going to be seeing the hearings on the January 6th coup. And for anybody who remembers the Watergate hearings and the devastating impact that that had, will the January 6th uh, hearings, which will bring in presumably testimony, depositions from members of Congress themselves, will that have any impact on November? Well, I wish it would, because what happened on January 6th was one of the great disgraces of American history, and the role of the sitting president of the United States in it will, I mean, be... Uh, to quote uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a moment, uh, well, what did he say? A moment that will live in, in uh, infamy. Um, unfortunately, the reality of politics, I'm talking about you know, facts, not wishes. The reality of politics is that most voters are concerned with the present and the, and, and the future, uh, not events on, on January 6th. So uh, that's a historical reckoning that needs to take place. I hope voters factor it into their consideration that you have in a Republican party, a party that is unwilling to confront the role 
its own leaders played in one of the most lawless and violent acts in, in, in American history, certainly in terms of its uh, intentions, if not quite in terms of, thank God, in terms of its uh, uh, effects. But um, Americans are gonna vote on what interests them. So the strong card for Democrats is not gonna be January 6th. I think that's something that has to be done for the sake of historical truth and accuracy. What's going to play better for them, for moderate Democrats, is the question of the future of reproductive rights in, uh, in, American, in, in American life. One issue that uh, Republicans have really ginned up pretty successfully, certainly for their constituents, is uh, critical race theory, which seems to be somehow whatever it is you want it to be or not to be. Uh, and to use this of a piece with uh, voting rights restrictions and other things that, that, that seem to be just a nasty package that, again, voters will see themselves as they wish to be seen in this and say, yes, that's about me and vote accordingly. Well, I think critical race theory is a real issue. And I, I mean, there, we, we, we can sort of um, draw uh, fine distinctions between critical race theory as a kind of a legal theory that emerges in, 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 in elite law schools, but something like critical race theory, the, the stepchildren of critical race theory, has in fact become uh, uh, increasingly a part of American curricula at multiple levels. And I'm not just talking about you know, uh, uh, ethnic studies departments at UC San Francisco or, or, or whatever, it's, uh, it's, a real, it's a real issue. Now, it's important to distinguish two things. One of them is, should American students learn the real and sometimes very ugly facts of American history, including our shameful legacies of slavery uh, and institutionalized racism? Of course, the answer is yes. Should they also be taught that um, some that the United States is essentially uh, a product of uh, uh, white supremacy that whose the founding ideals of which were uh, false when false when written continually betrayed. That's another that's another thing. And so I think Democrats are kidding themselves if they think that this is just some demagogic attack by uh, Republicans and conservative-minded uh, uh, parents. Um, on a, a kind of a make a made up issue to scare scare the electorate. This is happening in many ways. And it's not just critical race theory. You know, you in California have had this extraordinary debate about ethnic studies in, uh, in being taught as a requirement in public schools. And I seem to remember that when the first iteration of ethnic studies uh, emerged, it was the Jewish community that had to stand up and fight it because it was saturated with anti-Semitic tropes and because it excluded the experience of, of Jews. So this is a real, this is a real issue. Democrats do not want to become a party that is uh, indifferent to a pedagogy that many Americans feel does not reflect what this country is or what their values are about. And if they do that, they are going to dramatically hurt themselves, not just next, uh, not just in November, but in 2024 as well. We saw an example of that in uh, Virginia when uh, the Democrats underestimated that issue with Glenn Youngkin then being uh, elected. But, but again, there seems to be so much overreach of it and it de the definitions seem to vary from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I mean, how much of this will really stick and how much of it is really about parents should control what it is that their children learn, which is what we found out about sex education and other topics. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't pretend to have an exact answer to, to just how much control parents should have, but they should have some. And so when Terry McAuliffe basically told parents to stick their, keep their noses out of what was being taught uh, to their children, it was uh, one of the great political blunders of all time. It was also just wrong. Uh, parents should have a say at multiple levels in the education that ultimately through their taxes uh, they are paying for. And that how that point is lost on such a significant segment of the progressive side of the debate uh, is incredible to me. Um, uh, you know, you heard it from James Carville uh, when he talked about the elections back in, in November. I, I can't do his wonderful accent, but I think what he said is, it's the damn wokeness. Um, you know, Democrats ought to have a real agenda that matters to middle-class American voters 
about solving uh, pocketbook issues and making the country better. If they want to wage, if Democrats want to wage a political battle as a cultural war, it's, it's not just political malpractice of the worst sort. I think it's a betrayal of, of democratic values. We're having questions uh, from all of you um, for, um, for Brett Stevens, and let's get to some of them. Dan says, what do you think of the many tell-all books from Trump administration insiders that are published after the impeachment hearings and after the 2020 elections that essentially say he was unfit or even dangerous? I think Mike Esper, the defense secretary, is the latest. Well, I think we could have told you that in 2015. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, um, salacious, but I, I, I have yet to see uh, a revelation beyond sort of the fine grained detail that surprises me in the least. You know, one of the things that, one of the ways in which I think uh, many Americans, particularly Democrats, misapprehended the Trump administration, or I should say Trump himself, is that the scandal was not what was hidden. The scandal was what was in plain view. You didn't have to go hunting for P tapes or believe the Steele dossier or even imagine that Trump was secretly colluding with, uh, with the Russians or was on the take from some Russian oligarchs uh, or other to see what the problem with the, Trump, with the Trump presidency was, which is that you had a bigoted, manifestly unfit man uh, in, uh, in the Oval Office. That was, that was the scandal. So there is no need for a conspiracy theory. There is no need to go behind the scenes. Uh, on January 6, 2021, I wrote a column titled Impeach and Convict right now. Um, and I said at the very beginning, um, from the moment Trump, Trump's political odyssey began, we knew what we were gonna get, an arsonist in the White House. Um, there, of course, there are going to be questions about the Middle East and what's going on there now. We had the report of the Al Jazeera journalist being shot and killed uh, yesterday. I think it was during an Israeli raid uh, in, um, uh, I can't remember where exactly where it was, but th things still seem to be topsy-turvy there as well, speaking of the topic of this particular discussion that we're having, or maybe even at a tipping point. There, the, the, the tipping points in, in Israeli-Palestinian, uh, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are, are almost numberless. Uh, all of this, first of all, let me say that uh, um, anytime a journalist is killed um, in the line of duty covering it, it's heartbreaking, period. Um, and uh, it, it, extraordinarily upsetting. And also a reminder a reminder that the news media that so much of the American public loves to uh, detest um, puts uh, its uh, lives and its safety uh, on the line all the time. And this was certainly the case with, with uh, this, particular, uh, this particular journalist. So it's a tragedy. Secondly, um, I'm not sure if anyone has yet established how she died, I understand that both the PA, the Palestinian Authority and Israel are determined to conduct an inquiry to find out. And that, that's obviously something that should happen. And if, if she died from uh, an Israeli uh, bullet, the, the Israeli government obviously needs to take uh, um, account of that, take responsibility uh, uh, for it. The larger question is, you know, we've had um, what almost seems like the stirrings of potentially a third intifada. Uh, um, more than a dozen Israeli civilians, um, including Israeli Arabs, uh, murdered in gruesome terrorist attacks in the last, uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Um, I can only hope that um, it doesn't become an intifada because I was in Israel during the second intifada and that was, um, that was a horror, uh, and it was a horror not just uh, for, uh, uh, it was a horror for both sides. So I hope it doesn't become that. Uh, the other question, of course, is with respect to what's going to happen to the Israeli uh, government. When we were in, in our digital green room before, someone asked me about that, and it's, it's absolutely unpredictable. Governments that, strangely enough, there's a theory in political science that when governments hang by a thread, they tend to hang uh, much longer than expected, just because any one person in breaking a coalition uh, not only earns eternal hatred from one side, um, uh, but uh, um, 
you know, has an uncertain future in, in the next government. So we will see. I hate to make predictions about Israeli politics because I don't even think Naftali Bennett uh, knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Here's a question from uh, Eric on a topic I hadn't heard about, the uh, Biden administration's Iran talks giving Russia a free pass to trade with Iran? That, well, that the Iran a long time are, relationship. The Iran talks are for the... Uh, present purposes, basically more of it. Um, uh, a month ago, uh, the, the kind of leaked, quasi-leaked drafts of agreements had um, the allowed uh, the Russian government, irrespective of the sanctions otherwise being applied to its economy, to um, uh, not apply to uh, an offer or a deal to build civilian nuclear power in Iran. Now that's come to a standstill in part because of the war in Ukraine and the collapse of relations with Russia. And it's come also to a standstill because uh, of a revolt among uh, many members of the Democratic Party against this suggestion that uh, the United States should take the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps the IRGC off one of the uh, lists in terms of its uh, 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 classification as a terrorist or, um, or, um, organization, which actually speaks a little bit to the ineptitude with which Rob Malley, in my view, conducted these negotiations by giving the Iranians the sense that they could basically get everything. He um, ended up going beyond what was politically possible for, for um, even, uh, uh, even Democrats in Congress. And, and I'm honestly quite grateful for it because I think that um, a new uh, Iran deal on essentially the same terms as the last one um, is a loser for the region, uh, a loser for Israel, and above all, a loser for the United States. We are hopscotching around because that's the way people's questions are coming in. Doug Murrell, because we talked about NATO earlier, says, do you think Sweden and Finland should be admitted to NATO? If this happens, what impact would it have on the ongoing Russia-Ukraine um, conflict and upon Putin's mindset and his game plan, which are unpredictable, but never to the good? Yes, I think they absolutely should be members of, of uh, uh, NATO. Uh, the sooner, um, the sooner, the better. I think what, particularly the, the Finns, who have a very long border with Russia, um, are beginning to appreciate is that um, Putin, uh, you know, the crocodile's appetite doesn't end with 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 just its first bite, and so they could uh, potentially be uh, next in line. So I think that uh, I hope that both governments bid for membership. I hope they're admitted. It's a way of underlining the fact that in invading Ukraine, Putin did the opposite of one of the things he wanted. He didn't divide NATO. He, in fact, united and uh, expanded, uh, uh, expanded NATO. So it's good for European security. Um, it's a good way of uh, further penalizing Russia for its aggression. And quite frankly, this is something I've changed my mind on, but I mentioned earlier that I think in a, in a, I can see a future in which Ukraine is a member of uh, NATO, even if Russia manages to bite off a certain amount of its territory. Would an expanded NATO with or without Ukraine, just would look, looking at, um, uh, at uh, Finland and Sweden right now, would that um, provoke Putin or would it get him to back off, do you think? Uh, I hope it would get him to back off. I think one of the things that we've learned, not just with Putin, but with other dictators, is that they um, don't, um, they usually uh, aren't responsive to um, sweetness and uh, appeasement, um, which uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old word, but a, a useful one here. Um, so no, I don't think it would provoke uh, Putin. I think it would uh, help deter him. One of the things that Putin should learn uh, from this experience is that if he cannot defeat a, um, a Ukrainian military, that at least on paper is a fraction the size of his, uh, not particularly well armed, he is certainly not going to be able to defeat uh, a military with the kind of technological and logistical and manpower capacities as NATO. And we have a responsibility to protect a free world. When Joe Biden said he would protect every inch of NATO soil, 
I think it was a very useful signal to send to Putin. Uh, Toby had a question about the rightward drift in the Republican Party. He said it's been reported that Michigan Republican gubernatorial candidate Ryan Kelly attacked the idea of de democracy, saying, quote, socialism, it starts with democracy. Is, is this a kind of notion that Republicans will dismiss or will it be taken up, if not by the leadership, then by some of the rank and file who seem to be moving farther and farther from center? You know, several years ago, I just decided that I was going to, uh, I just stopped thinking of myself as a Republican, um, uh, including my party affiliation. Um, and so, you know, talking about the Republican Party today, I, six or so years ago, I could have spoken with what I thought was real familiarity with it. It's, uh, it's like uh, talking about, um, I don't know, uh, cuisine in, in, in uh, Bulgaria or something. It's just a subject I know less and less about in the sense that um, I guess nothing surprises me about what's happening in the Republican, uh, Republican Party and the anti-democratic drift, the anti-liberal drift, and I use the word liberal in its broad and honorable and, and John Stuart Millian sense, um, is one of the most frightening phenomena of, um, of, of today because you now have a major political party uh, in the United States with an increasingly tenuous relationship with notions of the rule of law, um, fair and free uh, elections, the safe uh, and orderly transfer of, uh, of power, and of course the right to vote. And uh, so, uh, you know, this is a party that I have deep policy differences with the Democratic Party, but I'm willing to put lots of my policy differences aside because there are things that are more valuable than whether the, my tax rate is here or there. Uh, in fact, Joe Biden, just, I think today called Trump the great MAGA king and said MAGA is, quote, the most extreme political organization in US history. In a way, it's as if the, the political party is being hollowed out from the inside and replaced with what were right-wing terrorist extremist groups that did exist on the fringe for decades. Well, I don't know. Look, I, I want to I wanna not get carried away by my own rhetoric, um, uh, which is to say, the Republican Party, whether you like it or not, and I certainly don't, is the opposition uh, party. Uh, comparisons to the Nazis, I think, do more to um, hurt Democrats uh, than help them. Uh, the Republican Party is a profoundly troubled party that has forgotten what it owes um, Democratic and small r Republican, par uh, re Republican governance. But people sometimes ask me, why am I not a Democrat? Why haven't I just become a liberal? And the reason is that I think any healthy society is going to have, needs a healthy conservative movement. I think in every society, Pat, there is going to be a conservative faction. There were conservatives in Maoist China. There were conservatives in Stalinist Russia. It's just almost a function of human uh, psychology. The real question is, is there a conservatism that plays by the rules? Is there a conservatism that believes in the broad structure of um, um, the kind of liberal democratic experiment uh, writ large? Is there a conservatism that upholds rights of conscience, free speech, human rights? There and, was. Well, there was. And what I am trying to do in my writing and what I'm trying to do you know, in my small way is maintain the hope that at some point in the future, there can be a healthy conservatism uh, again. So I don't wanna be in the business of simply excommunicating uh, every conservative I've ever disagreed with or, or just writing the party off of the stage of um, uh, moral respectability. What, I'm, what I'd like to do is try to persuade at least some number of uh, Republicans that the MAGA direction of the party is, is poisonous for them as Americans. Um, and that's why you know, I, I, I feel very comfortable with you know, what I've done politically. I know a lot of my readers tear their hair out. Um, but you know, look, in 1933, a Christian Democrat by the name of Conrad Adenauer, and here I'm violating my own rule by employing a, a German analogy. Um, left Germany because his brand of conservatism couldn't coexist with national socialism. And uh, thank God Conrad Adenauer did that and then preserved the basis for restoring 
a morally fit federal republic of Germany, West Germany, once, once the Nazi regime fell. And so I want, I, I admire other conservatives who have stuck to our policy ideas, our basic belief in limited government, um, and at the same time reject this kind of uh, populist authoritarian drift in the party. We mentioned the journalist who was shot and killed, the Al Jazeera journalist, and, and Howard wants to know whether you think Mohammed bin Salman will ever be held to account for the murder of Khashoggi and what the U.S. should do beyond what it's already done. Uh, the answer is almost certainly not. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship, even if it's a dictatorship under um, more modernizing um, at least superficially more modernizing uh, leadership. We have to accept that that's the Saudi Arabia that we're going to get. There needs to be a moral accounting for Khashoggi, and I don't think his memory uh, can ever be uh, forgotten. Um, and, and various efforts to seek the restitution that his family deserves. I'm, I'm not, I, of course, in a perfect world, in a better world, there would be that, uh, uh, that accounting, but I just don't see that happening and uh, there's a certain amount of realism that has to take place and that we have to weigh um, that outrage um, against our interests uh, in maintaining some form of relationship, I'm sorry to have to say this, but some form of relationship with Saudi Arabia. The world is what it is and the Saudis have options and um, uh, not all of those options um, are, uh, are helpful to us. Your column today about the pessimism in so many sectors of uh, the country, economic, social, um, cultural, um, made me think of the 70s idea about biorhythms. It's as if the country's biorhythms are all bottoming out at the same time. And yet you see some grounds for optimism. Well, and, and, and you know, you put it beautifully, Pat. I mean, if you think about it, every 50 years or so, uh, the United States, um, kind of uh, blunders into some kind of uh, set of systemic and overlapping crises. So 50 years ago in the 1970s, we had stagflation, Watergate, uh, the collapse of uh, our position in Vietnam, uh, seemingly the Soviet Union on, on a march um, uh, against us. Gas prices. Gas prices, malaise, et cetera, et cetera, social upheavals. And yet we figured it out. And uh, 40 or so years before then, we had the 1930s. And uh, there were crises in the United States in the uh, 1890s too, during the robber baron era and going back to the 1850s. So the concept of the biorhythm is actually a pretty, I think, a pretty good one. I don't wanna make too much of it, but the point, the larger point here is that we have confronted these same sorts of challenges before, crime waves, social change, uh, changes in, in kind of broad uh, morality and so on. And we've typically discovered, almost to our own surprise, the inner resources to contend with them. And, and one, one thing that gives me hope um, is, you know, uh, dictatorships are in the business of advertising their strength and hiding their weakness. They hide their weaknesses so well, they hide it even to themselves. So that someone like Vladimir Putin didn't understand just how weak his, uh, his uh, Potemkin army uh, uh, really, really was. Democracies do just the opposite. We obsess about our weaknesses. Um, our, our pessimism is, is a national uh, pastime and we hide our strengths even from ourselves. But there's a paradox to pessimism, Pat, which is that when you think about everything that ails you, every now and then you start to try to do something about it, whether it's racial injustice, or uh, inflation and other economic problems, or solving a crime wave, or doing something about the kind of relentless partisanship that we've seen, particularly in the last 15 years. And so we are continuously surprising ourselves with inner reserves of uh, resilience and strength and self-belief and can-doism that we didn't even know we had. Um, and sometimes I think that maybe what we're, uh, possibly accomplishing in Ukraine, and what we're seeing unfold there, can be an inspiration for our own renewal. So I think, I mean, it's a cliche to say it's always been a bad bet to bet against the United States. 
I think that's true. Uh, that's true today, um, and it's a. I think it's a source of what should be some long-term optimism and uh, intermediate-term realism. As our time is winding down, I was looking at the list in your column, and one thing I didn't see was something that's urgent but amorphous, and that's climate change. Yeah. We see it all around us, but it almost feels too big to do anything about, and yet we have leadership split over it, but it doesn't seem to be at the top of anyone's list, anyone in a position of real uh, power to do something about it. Right, and the rise in gas prices is a stark reminder that um, nobody's going to snap their fingers and solve uh, uh, this really serious um, crisis, but a crisis that extends way beyond uh, our borders and has to have some kind of comprehensive set of global solutions. My own sense is that um, this is going to be uh, addressed and addressed in realistic ways and successful ways in a manner very few of us um, conceive of today. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an economist named Bill Easterly who made a very useful distinction. He said, there's a difference between people who are planners and people who are searchers. Now, the planners are the people who have a five-year grandiose plan, whether it's uh, you know, the Soviet five-year plans or even the Green New Deal to throw trillions of dollars at, uh, um, at a problem, construct large bureaucracies and manage the problem. And the searchers are people who try to find what appear to be initially small-scale solutions that then turn into very large solutions. And if I were advising the Biden administration, and I know they're not going to take my advice on this subject, um, um, but if, I, if, if they did, I would say invest in a thousand uh, small to medium sized things rather than in two or three or four uh, very big things. Because when you invest in a lot of those things, you are going to find um, surprising solutions that have outsized results. Markets tend to work that way too, and they work, they often work uh, very well. And that's, I think, how this, how this solution is going to come about. We're not going to solve it by telling India that it can't burn carbon or telling China it can't burn carbon. They're just going to ignore it. We're going to solve it by creating technologies that are better, cleaner, more efficient, more economical, more sensible than the carbon-based technologies that we have today. We have a minute and we try to leave on an up note. Is there something that you think we can all look forward to, anticipate, unite about? Um, uh, a, a, a warm and pleasant summer in which we have not uh, mastered COVID, but in which um, the therapeutics that recently did so much to help my, um, my mother get over COVID in two days become ubiquitous and that we return in the immortal words of um, Warren Harding to some kind of normalcy, at least uh, socially. Um, and listen, let me say something a little broader. These kinds of conversations that we're having with this extraordinary participation, 2.8 thousand uh, or 2,800 people, I think are a sign of deep civic health. I'll give you one quick example because I think we have two minutes. Um, I have a conversation every week with my friend and liberal New York Times colleague, Gail Collins, wonderful lady. And if you look for my conversation with Gail on social media, it is nowhere to be found because social media consists of algorithms that are designed for outrage. And many of us watching social media might assume that that outrage button is all there is in American discourse. And yet the conversation I have with Gail, which is light and sometimes funny and always uh, civil and always decent, uh, is one of the most popular reads in all of the New York Times. And I think it's because Americans are hungry for a dialogue that is not destructive, a dialogue that bridges differences rather than exacerbate them. Um, and that's something that really gives me hope that deep down, we are not the avatars we try to be on, uh, on Twitter um, or the mirages we are on Facebook. We're human beings looking for connection, looking to bridge a divide. Brett Stevens, let's hope we can make it so. Thank you so much. The, um, Thanks for the honor of the interview.
the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist at the New York Times. And of course, thank you all for watching. Next week is a reminder, Ambassador Dennis Collins was supposed to be here on Tuesday. He cannot make it. So on Wednesday, we will be featuring Max Booth. That's Wednesday, the 18th of May. Thanks to all of the organizers and to all of you for watching and supporting this effort.